Well, I want to welcome everybody. It's 11 a.m. We want to uh, honor everybody's time. We uh, are so glad that you're here for uh, Dallas Christian College's uh, time with uh, Dr. Justin Bass. I want to remind everybody that uh, you have been muted and you need to keep your uh, Zoom mu muted. Uh, we welcome your questions and we'll address them at, uh, at the end. Um, and so what you can do is you can send, uh, click on, it's, it's very easy. Uh, you put your cursor, your cursor on the image of the person, uh, which would be me, and the chat icon comes up. Uh, you click it and you can send a message uh, with a question for Dr. Bass, <clears throat> and I will uh, respond with those at the end. I want to introduce to you our uh, former DCC adjunct professor, J Dr. Justin W. Bass. By the way, it's his birthday today. He has a PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary where one of our Dallas Christian College graduates, Mark uh, Yarbrough, has just become the president. Uh, he, uh, he got a PhD in New Testament studies. He has formally debated Dr. Bart Ehrman, uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, Dan Barker, and uh, Mufti uh, Hussein Kamani. He uh, currently lives in Amman, Jordan. He's here in the United States uh, just because uh, of God uh, uh, working that out because uh, times are tough there right now. He currently uh, works through an NGO and he's a professor of New Testament at Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary or JETS. Dr. Bass's new book, The Bedrock of Christianity, The Unalterable Facts of Jesus' Death and Resurrection, was officially released yesterday, April the 8th, 2020. I thought it was interesting. Daryl Bach of uh, The Passion of the Christ uh, fame has written the pre preface, and I've already read some of the book, and I got to tell you, it's amazing. Um, I, I was talking to Justin last night, telling him how impressed I was with his book. He's also written The Battle for the Keys, Revelation 1, 18, and Christ's Descent into the Underworld. When he's not working, he's reading, watching movies, usually the Lord of the Rings genre, and spending time with his high school sweetheart, Allison Bass, and their two kids, Ariana, who's 10, and Christian, who's 7. Uh, again, just to finish an introduction here, let me read just a portion of, uh, of Justin's introduction. He says, it is crucial that professing followers of Jesus all over the world know and understand the alt uh, unalterable historical facts undergirding their faith. As the Apostle Paul proclaimed to the philosophers of Athens, he has furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead, Acts 17.31. This book lays out these unalterable proofs that all believers should know, not only in order to strengthen and solidify their own faith, I love this, but also so that they will go on the offensive, not the defensive, with a skeptical and unbelieving world. It's with a great honor and privilege that I get a chance to introduce our uh, speaker and a good friend, uh, Dr. Justin Bass. Justin. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, I'll share my screen now. All right, is it looking good? Well, thank you again, uh, Mark. Thanks to Brian. Thanks to all who invited me to be a part of this. Uh, it's really a blessing uh, to be back with my DCC family. I taught at DCC for uh, almost five years, and so uh, it's really just a, a blessing to be back with you, even though it's uh, not on campus, but through this uh, Zoom meeting. But what a blessing to be able to proclaim Christ and him crucified and risen again uh, with you this morning. As Paul said, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Greeks, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the wisdom of God. I want to begin with some wisdom from the great British preacher Charles Spurgeon, of how Christians should respond to plagues and epidemics like we're in right now with the hope of Christ crucified and risen again. He actually tells this incredible story in his autobiography, and I encourage you to read the entire chapter. It's actually chapter 33 
in his autobiography. But he tells the story of how he ministered to the sick and the dying during a cholera epidemic. And this would be sometime around the mid, mid to later 1800s London. He says this, Slide's well, not going. Okay, there we go. <laughs> he says this, just now the cholera has come again. There can be little doubt, I suppose, about it being here already in some considerable force, and probably it may be worse. The Christian need not dread it, for he has nothing to lose, but everything to gain by death. Still, for the sake of others, he may well pray that God would avert his hand and not let his anger burn. But since it is here, I think it ought to be a motive for active exertion. If there ever be a time when the mind is sensitive, it is when death is abroad. I recollect when I first came to London how anxiously people listened to the gospel, for the cholera, for the cholera was raging terribly. There was little scoffing then. <laughs> they weren't laughing at the gospel then. All day and sometimes all night long, I went about from house to house and saw men and women dying, and oh, how glad they were to see my face. When many were afraid to enter their houses lest they should catch the deadly disease, we who had no fear about such things found ourselves most gladly listened to when we spoke of Christ and of things divine. And now again is the minister's time. And now is the time for all of you who love souls. See Spurgeon speaking to us. You may see men more alarmed than they are already. And if they should be, mind that you avail yourselves of the opportunity of doing them good. You have the balm of Gilead. When their wounds smart, pour it in. You know of him who died to save. Tell them of him. Lift high the cross before their eyes. Tell them that God became man, that man might be lifted to God. Tell them of Calvary and its groans and cries and sweat of blood. Tell them of Jesus hanging on the cross to save sinners. Tell them that there is life for a look at the crucified one. Tell them that he is able to save to the uttermost all them that come unto God by him. Tell them that he is able to save even at the 11th hour and to say that to the dying thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. And everybody's muted, but I can hear the amens. I can hear them. <laughs> Friedrich Nietzsche, to go kind of the opposite extreme here, <laughs> we have Spurgeon, the great man of faith, and here we have the, the atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. But he had a great, really wise statement in one of his books. He said, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. So many today do not have a why. I mean, just look at how many are reacting to this coronavirus epidemic all over the world. I don't know if you've been to Walmart or Costco lately. You'll find a lot of people that don't have a why. People that bum rush the toilet paper section do not have a why. Christians may not have a cure for the virus, but we do have a cure for fear, for anxiety, for hopelessness, and despair. And that cure is Christ. So many around you, so many around us are looking for meaning and forgiveness and hope in this dark, plague-ridden world, and we have Christ to offer them. They're looking for a story to believe, and we have the greatest story ever told. He is our why. He is our hope, and with him, we can bear any how. The Apostle Paul had the same why, had the same hope as Spurgeon, as we all know which enabled him to endure beatings and shipwrecks and sicknesses and imprisonments and starvation. He was even stoned once, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the drug. As he traveled across the Roman Empire, proclaiming Jesus is Lord. And Paul proclaimed the foundation for his why, the death and resurrection of Jesus, so well in Acts 17, which was already quoted by Mark. But he said this to the philosophers of Athens. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed, having furnished proof of this to all men 
by raising him from the dead. The proof that God has given to the world, according to Paul, and I would say according to all the New Testament, is that Jesus, that Jesus as the Son of God is his resurrection. That is our proof. That is the definitive proof. And I want to look at some of that proof with you this morning. I, I, this is what I, this was one of my, my main goal in this book, The Bedrock of Christianity. I want to lay out the bedrock proofs of our faith. And where I would begin is what I call the bedrock source of Christianity. And the bedrock source of Christianity is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. But I'm going to read, starting at verse 1, what you have here before you is the actual creedal tradition, this, this statement of faith by the earliest apostles that Paul is quoting. But let me just read you the entire first eight verses. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. What you just heard, specifically beginning with Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he was raised, he appeared. This is the most ancient testimony we have on record of Christianity. This is, this is the testimony of the earliest followers of Jesus, dating, according to all scholars, this isn't just according to Christians, this is according to even the most skeptical scholars who study these things, within five years of Jesus's death. This is what the earliest followers, Peter, James, the 12 minus Judas, Paul, this is what they were proclaiming and teaching beginning in Jerusalem and going out as they planted churches across the Roman Empire. Here we have the true essence of the gospel, the true apostles' creed, even. This is the actual apostles and what they formulated within five years of his death. And even if this was the only thing that survived, it's incredible to think about it, if this was the only thing we had, this was our New Testament, just this statement of faith, we would still have everything we need for life and salvation. But thank God we have so much more in the New Testament, an embarrassment of riches. And so what I do in my book is I lay out the bedrock facts that we gain from this bedrock source. And so I want to look at four of those bedrock facts, the ones that specifically deal with Jesus' death and resurrection. The first fact is he died. <laughs> Christ died. And if you just stop there, Christ died, again, everyone agrees that Christ died on that cross, that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius Caesar sometime in the early 30s AD. Not one teaching scholar in the entire Western world doubts the crucifixion of Jesus. They accept it the same way that we accept Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC, or that the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem in AD 70. These are Archimedean points of history, fixed points that cannot be refuted. Therefore, we know Christ hung on that cross and died. We know that happened. If we know anything from history, we know Christ died on, on that hung on that cross and died. But did he die for our sins? Did he die bearing the wrath of God? Did he die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Did he, as Paul said, love me and give himself up for me? I think that's answered in the next line. And he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is another bedrock fact. Just the claim of his resurrection alone is an incredible and powerful bedrock fact. No one ever claimed that a Messiah or any of the people that claimed to be Messiah had risen from the dead. This claim that a crucified carpenter, this, this man Yeshua, had risen from the dead is unparalleled. No one expected the Messiah to rise from the dead 
in the middle of history and then history to continue going on, let alone no one expected the Messiah to be crucified. They expected him to conquer, not to be crucified by the Romans. The Jews did believe in resurrection. They believe, believed it would happen at the end of the world, though, for the righteous and the wicked. Not, there would be no single resurrection in the middle of history. They got this mainly from Daniel chapter 12, where Daniel prophesies that many who sleep in the dust will rise, some to everlasting shame and contempt, and others to everlasting glory, and they will shine like the stars in the heavens. So what the earliest Jewish Christians said about Jesus was pure innovation. And when you think about the history of ideas, when you study when did certain ideas originate in history, this is the first time this idea came into being. So where did they get this idea if Jesus did not appear to them? If Jesus stayed dead, where did they get this idea of a risen, resurrected Messiah? More than that, we can even parallel Jesus's movement with 14 other messianic type movements a little bit before Jesus's time, during Jesus's time, and about a hundred years after Jesus's death. And in all these movements, these movements were very similar to Jesus, to Jesus's movement. They had a leader that was charismatic. M many of them were Jewish. Many of them made messianic type claims, claimed to be a king, claimed to do miracles. They gathered disciples around themselves. But eventually, in, those, in the case of those movements, they all fought against Rome, and then Rome would send their powerful, mighty leader, general of legions, their Roman general of legions, to crush their movement and kill their leader. And then that great general would usually say to the cheering crowds, are you not entertained? No, that's gladiator. That's gladiator. That's not in the ancient sources. But Whoever that these generals were, these Roman generals were, they were something like Maximus. They came out and they destroyed, they crushed these messianic type movements. And then when they did that, the movements came to an end. Their followers, if they survived, if Maximus let them live, they went out and got jobs. They found someone else to follow or they did something else. They did not ever say their leader had risen from the dead. Only the followers of Jesus made this unparalleled claim. So the question for, his, for historians is why? And I think N.T. Wright, New Testament scholar, says it well. He says, Jewish revolutionaries whose leader had been executed by the authorities and who managed to escape arrest themselves had two options, give up the revolution or find another leader. Claiming that the original le leader, leader was alive again was simply not an option, unless of course he was unless of course he was. The third fact, then he appeared. Jesus appeared, or at least was believed to have appeared to multiple groups and individuals, men and women, believers and even non-believers over a period of 40 days. It's, it's incredible. If you look at all the resurrection appearances, at least recounted in the New Testament, I'm sure there were more than this. But if you look at all of them, you have pretty much 12. There may be some overlap, but you basically have 12 distinct accounts of resurrection appearances of Jesus in the New Testament. You have appearances to four individuals, Mary, who was first, Mary Magdalene. We have Peter, Jesus's chief disciple. We have James, his brother, and we have Paul, his former enemy. So those four individuals had a unique experience with the resurrected Jesus. Then we have eight groups of people. The group of women with Mary Magdalene, the two on the Emmaus Road, the 12, more than 500 at one time, a remarkable appearance. Seven of Jesus' disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, the 11 on the mountain in Galilee when he said, go out and make disciples of all nations, and then at his ascension, probably around 120, witnessed his ascension, according to the first chapter of Acts. But what's even more incredible is half of those appearances, and maybe more than half because there may be some overlap, as I said, but six of the 12 appearances show up already in our earliest bedrock source in, in 1 Corinthians 15. 
the three individuals, Peter, James, and Paul, and then to the 12, the 500, and to all the apostles. So we already, so if you go through the rest of the New Testament, you only find six more appearances of Jesus that's, that's beyond our bedrock source. And I like what this agnostic New Testament historian, uh, Paula Friedrichsen, said in this special on the search for Jesus back in 2000 with Peter Jennings. She says, and this is how they close the entire series. This is a powerful way to close it. She said, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but I do know that as a historian, they must have seen something. Yes, Dr. Friedrichsen, what did they see? Great question to ask your neighbor this Easter. What did they see? Whatever they saw transformed their lives to the point of being willing to suffer and to die for what they saw. Because incredibly, when it comes to the three individuals in this creed, Peter, James, and Paul, we also have strong historical evidence that those three in particular died as martyrs for their faith. So we know they believe Jesus appeared to them, and we know they died believing it. So whatever they saw, it was worth giving their lives for. They sealed their testimonies with their own blood. The last fact, the fourth fact, the indestructible movement of the Nazarenes. This, this is, uh, I would say, kind of a, a unique contribution to these arguments on the resurrection. So I want to spend a little time on this one because you won't, you won't hear about this one uh, really the way, the way I present it in my book. It's the, it's the argument and it's the undeniable fact. You cannot deny this fact any more than you can deny the sun is in the sky, that there is this worldwide movement of followers of this crucified Nazarene and how it has really dominated the world and its ripple effects are still being seen to the ends of the earth to this day. So what's the best historical explanation for the rise of this movement that went on to conquer the Roman Empire, not by sword, but by love and by sacrifice. And it's still, to this day, the largest religion in the world, roughly uh, going towards three billion, at least professing followers of Jesus. So what happened between Jesus's death, which we know happened, we know he hung on that cross and died, and then we have this explosive movement that began in the very same place that he died. What happened in between? If Jesus stayed dead, how did the movement get going? It's really difficult to get your, moving, get, get your movement going when you're dead. Try it sometime. If there's anyone out there that want, wants to try it, I dare you. The Big Bang had a banger. And the Christian movement also needs a cause for its singularity. And I believe... History shows that that cause is the resurrection of Jesus. Rabbi Gamaliel made this very powerful claim. He spoke better than he knew in the book of Acts in chapter 5. He didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't believe this movement would go on to be the largest religious movement in the world. But he makes this statement that I think Luke is speaking through him, and I think the Holy Spirit is, is inspiring him when he says this, but he it's in response to dealing with Peter and John. Peter and John are preaching Jesus all throughout Jerusalem, and, and they won't, they, even if they arrest them and put them in prison, the angel lets them out of prison, so they, they don't, the leaders don't know what to do. And so Rabbi Gamaliel stands up and he says, you know what? In this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, Peter and John. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. I love that. You will find yourselves God fighters. As I said, I think Luke, who wrote Acts, is arguing through Gamaliel that if the Christian movement is of men, it will fail. But if it is of God, it cannot be destroyed. It is indestructible, unstoppable, an immortal creation of God. And all who fight against it will find themselves fighting against God. 
And if we, now we have 2000 years of hindsight, <laughs> we can look back on this claim, on this statement, on this movement and watch it go throughout the world. And we can see many did, and still to this day fight against this movement, whether through ignorance or arrogance or both. In the first 300 years of the church, the Caesars tried very hard and they had all the power in the world to stomp out this movement. And yet they failed as Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire by the time of Constantine. The barbarians after the fall of Rome in the West and the Vikings did all they could to conquer the Christian church, but the church ended up conquering them and converted them. The Ottoman Empire conquered and sacked Constantinople in the East. The anti-Christian philosophies of the Enlightenment, many of those representatives said, Christianity will die away, Christianity will go. It's going to be replaced by reason or science or something else. Atheistic philosophies of just the last hundred years, like communism or secular humanism, for 60 years, communism did all they could in Russia and other places to ban the Bible, to ban Christianity. And then when communism was lifted, now most of, many of those nations outright declare themselves Christian nations like Hungary and Poland, for example. Or even where I am today, in the, where I've been living in the Middle East, in the Middle East or in China or Nigeria, the persecution of, of Christians is at its height, the most persecuted group in the world. Again and again, the gates of hell have tried to destroy God's church, and again and again, it has failed. But probably the, the greatest threat of all to Christianity was the Beatles in the 1960s. If you remember, they actually said that they were more popular than Jesus for a time. They, they claimed to be more popular than Jesus. And John Lennon made this just defying statement in uh, an interview. He said, this was in 1966, he said, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. And I'm right. And we'll be proved right. And I know what many of you, you are asking right now. You're saying, who are the Beatles? Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton, I think captures, if you study the last 2,000 years of church history well, he says, Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. Indeed. And it's interesting if you think about the Christian movement and how it's advanced and conquered. It didn't just survive for a while and then disappear or die out later. Like it could have conquered the Roman Empire and then disappeared. Like, for example, Genghis Khan's movement. Where, where are the followers of Genghis Khan today? That, that, they, they conquered more of the world than the Roman Empire. But Genghis Khan's movement is gone. It's disappeared from history. And neither did it just remain in one part of the world. I mean, why didn't the Christians stay in the Middle East up to this present day, and just in the Middle East, or in Rome at least. If they, even if they conquered Rome, why didn't they stay in Rome to this day? Like, we can parallel, like the Jains or the Sikhs, those religions have always stayed in India. Or the Confucianists, they've never made it past China, really. Or the Shintoists in Japan, or the Scientologists in California. We keep the Scientologists in California for a reason. Or consider Hinduism, one of, the, one of the only four world religions. Hinduism has been around, at least they claim, over 3,000 years. And yet, for some reason, the Hindu gods have not been able to reach across the borders of India. Almost that, the vast majority, in the 90, 90th percentile, of Hindus have always remained in India. Why is that? I mean, if Krishna was true, if he was a real God, don't you think he would reach out to some of his neighbors, to some other nation? Don't you think he'd reach out to someone in Mexico at some point? It hasn't. I think those arguments can, if we use Gamaliel's test, would show that those religions are not of God, but of men. The Christian movement, on the other hand, is the only truly world religion, I think, if you study it rightly. It went on to triumph over the Roman Empire. It triumphed over the gods of Egypt and Greece and Rome that had been worshipped for thousands of years. 
the crucified Christ wiped them off the face of the earth. He said, come out of her and never enter her again, like he said to one of the demons while he was doing his public ministry. And even gods we love, like Thor. I mean, we love Thor, but no one worships Thor anymore. There's been no reformer for Thor, no Martin Luther for Thor or for Zeus. Why is that? Well, it's probably because they never existed in the first place. The evidence suggests Christianity will continue to triumph over the world, even over the next 50 years. All the Pew research says that. And this is from even the agnostic and skeptic Bart Ehrman in his most recent book. I love the title, The Triumph of Christianity, a great title. And he says in this, in this uh, se section, he says why he, he was inspired to write this book about how Christianity has gone on to conquer throughout the world. And it was when he was in Athens, he was in Greece, and he was looking around at the ruins of these temples to these ancient gods, that, the, so many of these gods, like I said, that have just been wiped off the face of the earth. And he says this, then the realization struck me, in the end, Paul won. What Paul preached that day on the Areopagus eventually triumphed over everything that stood below me in the Agora and above me on the Acropolis. It overwhelmed both the temple of Hephaestus and the Parthenon. No one except probably Paul himself would have predicted it. Yet it happened. Christianity eventually took over Western civilization. I like how he says that. Paul himself would have predicted it. Yeah, Paul would have predicted it. And so would have Luke. And so would have all the apostles who saw the risen Jesus, who heard Jesus himself predict that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. So I think history, hindsight 2020 now, we can say that the latter of Gamaliel's options has proven true. This movement is of God. Christ still rules over a spiritual empire that includes a third of the inhabitants of planet Earth. More followers than Facebook. Did you know that? There are more followers of Jesus than followers on Facebook. People all over the world from just about every nation, tongue, tribe, and language will be saying this Easter, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So what is the best historical explanation for these bedrock facts? if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if he did not appear to people, if he stayed dead, was it all a hoax? Did fishermen by their own power turn the Roman empire upside down? Was all the greatest literature, music, art, films, philosophy, morality, and ethics the world has ever seen inspired by a lie? I don't have enough faith to believe that. And you don't, you don't either. No, I think the apostles got it right when they proclaimed all over Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. And let me just close on that word, witnesses. You shall be my witnesses, Jesus says in Acts 1.8. I think this one word captures the primary challenge of the resurrection of Jesus, not just this Easter, but all every day. The argument of the gospels is, is that Jesus has risen from the dead and is Lord of the world, and Caesar is not. Therefore, we have work to do. His followers have work to do. We are called to be witnesses. This world needs meaning, forgiveness, and hope now more than ever. Your family, your friends, your neighbors need hope. There's only one hope, and that's Jesus Christ. Proclaim him. As Spurgeon said, lift high the cross before their eyes, Tell them of Jesus hanging on the cross to save sinners. Tell them of Calvary's groans and cries and sweat of blood. Tell them that Jesus knows what it is to have his lungs filled with blood, collapse and suffocate to death as sadly many are experiencing through this coronavirus. Tell them when he hung on that cross, he loved you and gave himself up for you. And on the third day, he was raised again. Amen. Thanks. I'll pass it over to, to Mark. All right. Wow. <laughs> 
I got all kinds of uh, I got got all kinds of uh, responses in the chat area, uh, Justin. Just saying, man, uh, what an incredible thing. Uh, the people, you. if you want, to, glory. if you want more, uh, folks, you can go to uh, Justin's book. You can order it on Amazon. Uh, Justin happens to be here in Dallas. If you can somehow make arrangements with him, you can get an autographed copy. I know that uh, we're going to get some. But uh, we want to just take just a, a few minutes uh, for questions that have been uh, uh, sent to me uh, in the chat room. So, uh, Justin, uh, first of all, the first question I got was, what's the, been the biggest challenge you have faced in Jordan uh, with convincing people of the reality of Jesus and his resurrection? I would say when it comes to, we're, we're talking about Muslims, I, th I think they, the, 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 the brainwashing is so deep that the culture, the, the, the Muslim world, especially like Jordan is, is a Muslim government, a Muslim dominated culture, like uh, uh, the majority of the Middle East. And people are just so ingrained in, in just this way of thinking in, in a similar way to people in the West, people in Europe, people in America, even people who don't believe anymore in Christianity, they are still molded by the Judeo-Christian foundation of Europe and America. And so they're, they're, they think like a Christian, even if they don't believe it anymore. And it's that way with, with Muslims. And I, and I find to share with them the great truths of Christianity, it's just, I mean, there's just such a wall. It's like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians when he's talking about uh, preaching the gospel to his fellow Jews, that there's this veil over their hearts, and it can only be removed by Christ. And so, you know, as I love to, of course, present arguments, and, you know, this, this is what I'm all about, is wanting to persuade people. But, but I've found, you know, God's humbled me because I found, you know, you can't argue, obviously, anyone into the kingdom. God has to open their eyes. And I found with, especially with Muslims that I've talked to, and, and praise God, I've seen many come to Christ. I've baptized some in the Jordan River. Mark was a part of that, uh, uh, right there, right there in Jordan. And uh, so I've seen them come to Christ, but I would say, you know, really just needing the Lord to open their eyes. And, and so I think just for me, that's the most difficult thing, because I've seen so many of them show that part of the part, show that just veil over their heart, veil over their eyes, and just not respond to the gospel. Um, and so, so the hope that they would. But I think that's been the biggest challenge. There's just no, there's some intellectual types, but the vast majority arguments are just going to fall, fall for them. They, they, what they need is really just the love of Jesus, the power of the cross, the power of his resurrection life, and they need to see it in Christians around them. And that, that's one of the number one way reasons Muslims are coming to Christ um, is the love of Christians and, and dreams and visions too. Jesus is breaking through that barrier by, by coming to them in dreams and visions. But, but uh, I would say, but, but the love of Christians is really number one. So, you know, Justin, you're right. One of the, one of the coolest moments uh, when we visited uh, with you guys in Jordan was watching a Muslim man, brilliant man, being baptized in the Jordan River. <laughs> that was just incredible. Hey, I've got a great question. Uh, you, are, you are incredibly uh, knowledgeable about all of this, uh, so much so obviously written a book. Has any Christian ever set out to prove Jesus a hoax and come away an atheist? that you know of? <clears throat> you know what? I, I would say it this way. There have been many, and, and Bart Ehrman would be an example of this. There have been many, the evangelical world, the Christian world, gone, you know, had Christian parents, went to Sunday school, read the Bible, went to, went to some, some kind of Christian a school growing up. And then through their own studies of other things, uh, many times like with Bart Ehrman going off to Yale and having professors convince him, make him think that there are errors in the Bible, that's what led him down the path towards agnosticism. But what I would say is, is that in every case that I have seen, they are rejecting a caricature of Christianity. So what I've yet to see is someone who really knows 
in depth these bedrock truths of Christianity and then become an atheist. I've only seen, and all the people I've talked to, and even the, the most brilliant ones like Bart Ehrman, they rejected, a fun, I would say, a fundamentalist type understanding of Christianity, a very Christianity light, <laughs> kind of God is awesome and that's it kind of message. And they didn't know the deep, the deep truths of the faith and then become an atheist. So I haven't seen that. I, I, have, I, have, I have said in some of my lectures, there are people I've studied, no, no one I've studied that are alive, but some in the past, like Friedrich Nietzsche, for example, there are people who I think who have understood Christianity and still rejected it. So Nietzsche understood the greatness of Christianity, but he wanted to kind of create his own, anti, and that's why he called himself the Antichrist, <laughs> because he wanted to, to create his own new philosophy beyond uh, morality. Christian morality and 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 but he understood the beauty and the love of Jesus he just rejected it and there are there are definitely some people like that but someone who was who truly had the depth and of understanding of the bedrock truths of Christianity and then became an unbeliever I'm sure it can happen because there's other reasons why people reject the faith it's not always it's rarely intellectual it's usually a morality issue it's usually a uh, has to do with autonomy that they want to be independent they want to go their own way or they're angry at God for some reason uh, like a problem with evil type type issue. Uh, but yeah, that, that's what I would say. People have understood it, but I haven't seen anybody that's truly new in this depth and then. Uh, another question. How, how has your study, uh, the, the study of this book, how did this study of this book change you? Well, you know, I, I, tell, I tell, one of the stories I tell in the book is a story about Tim Keller. Yeah a story where Tim Keller got thyroid cancer years ago, the, the pastor from uh, uh, Manhattan uh, the Presbyterian Church. Tim Keller got thyroid cancer and he was, he was healed from it ultimately, but he was, he was in a ho hospital for a while and he had time to read and he read a lot and he read while he was there, the Resurrection of God, which I have right here at my elbow, I have it right here, by N.T. Wright, which is like 750 pages. And he says, that after he read that, even though he'd been a pastor for decades, he was a believer in Jesus, that like certain amount of floors went down in his belief in Jesus uh, because of understanding, wow, he really did rise from the dead. And I would say a similar thing has happened to me. I, I would say even kind of before, it was really what inspired me to write this book. It didn't necessarily happen at the broken book. It happened really even before and it's what inspired me to write it because it was through the last 20 years of since I became a Christian in college, that the evidence has always been one of the number one things I point to for why I became a Christian and, and, and continued to become a Christian. I mean, to con continue to follow Jesus. And uh, the, the study of it over the last 20 years, those floors just went down in my heart and just more and more understanding what it means that Jesus is alive and, and my, my Savior and that he loved me and gave himself for me. Just, just has really, really transformed my life again. You know, I don't want to call it a second baptism, but it's, it's a, a, you know, more and more depth of, of knowing him. Uh, just real quickly, you have a couple of minutes before we're going to uh, transition over to uh, uh, Dr. Smith, President Smith, uh, college, uh, Dallas Christian College president. Uh, any secular resources that are not known uh, that are great for the resurrection? I mean, study. Secular. <clears throat> I mean, one, one, one book I would recommend everyone read is called um, A Brief History of Thought by Luke Ferry. I think I talked, I talked about this book back when I was teaching at DCC. And uh, it's, an, it's a book by an atheist philosopher. And he, t he talks about the resurrection. And, but what he does is he breaks he breaks uh, the history of thought into three stages, Greek philosophy, Christianity, and secular humanism, atheism, which is what, what he comes down on. But when he talks about Christianity, he talks about how it's the greatest thing, the greatest idea, the greatest story ever to enter the mind of man. I mean, it's, it's the greatest thing. And, and if it were true, he wishes it were true. And if it were true, he would be a taker, basically. And so... <laughs> It's a great, it's a great account of, of what an unbeliever who really understands the, what it means if Jesus rose from the dead to get his perspective. It's excellent. But as far as people who write 
about the resurrection. I mean, uh, the, the best of the skeptics who are arguing against it would be someone like Bart Ehrman. But really, his position to this to, at this point is basically just agnosticism. He just says, I don't know what happened. I don't I know. G, I know Peter believed Jesus appeared to him. I know Paul believed it. But I don't know what happened. He just wants to say, I don't know. And, you know, that that's fine. But <clears throat> Well, guys, we've got uh, about four minutes. Uh, Dr. Smith, uh, president of Dallas Christian College, is going to uh, end our time. Uh, however, if you want to stick around, uh, we can unmute, and you guys can ask uh, Dr. Bass, uh, Bass whatever questions you'd like to ask. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Smith, if you would join us and close us out, we really appreciate everybody being here. Oh, uh, by the way, I forgot to say, that uh, the 70th person uh, to sign up for this uh, session um, is going to win uh, one of your books uh, in honor of our 70th birthday, which is this coming year. Awesome. So, yeah, it's kind of weird. Uh, the person who is the 70th is uh, Jason Duke, who is the great grandson of the founder of DCC. Wow. It's kind of crazy, but anyway. Uh, Providential. You'll get a copy of your signed autograph book, okay? Uh, Dr. Smith, would you close this out? Yeah, we, we, we promised that wasn't rigged, um, <laughs> uh, but that's, a, <laughs> that's okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This was uh, kind of a new thing for us, a new event, and we're so excited that Justin could join us uh, and, uh, and do what was uh, originally supposed to be a chapel service, but this is exciting. We got to uh, reach many more that we normally wouldn't. So uh, many of you know DCC well, but uh, just for the record, I want you to know that uh, this kind of thing is what we're all about. And in fact, uh, we stand um, on our mission uh, for the glory of God. We want to reach um, all people, all nations, and we want to produce the kinds of leaders that want above all other things to be workers for the harvest and to uh, reach all nations uh, for Christ, and uh, Justin has been a big part of developing many of those uh, those students and those graduates, and many others have as well, and many of our other faculty, and so I'm very proud to be part of uh, a college that puts Christ first in all things, so um, I am excited to have somewhat celebrated Easter by um, talking about the um, the hard facts of the resurrection and those those truly bedrock um, evidences that uh, make us be able to stand on a faith that, that is like no other. And the kind of conviction that we can get from that is uh, second to none. Um, our faith is distinct, it is unique, and uh, I'm excited to, uh, to be a part of uh, a presentation, a discussion today that highlights those facts. So, um, I would invite uh, any of you who would like to, to go ahead and, and unmute and uh, stay on video. We'll, we'll switch to a gallery view probably, and then you can uh, continue to interact for another few minutes. Uh, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being a part of uh, DCC and, um, and what we could uh, offer to you all uh, as, our, as our larger faith community. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Justin. And uh, right now, we're going to continue with some questions. Again, if uh, some of you want to unmute, uh, put your uh, picture up, you can certainly do that. Um, uh, Justin, one of the, the big questions uh, here is uh, from Kim, and he's asked, what do you believe is the greatest contribution of the Essenes to the resurrection of Jesus? Well, the, es the Essenes, and, and main, the, we mainly know about the Essenes, we know about them from Josephus and things, but of course we know about them firsthand from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when you study the Des Dead Sea Scrolls, we learn about their views of the Messiah, the fact that they believe that there was multiple Messiahs coming actually, one that was going to be the, of the line of David, one of the line of Aaron, a priestly Messiah, and a Davidic kind of conquering kingly type messiah um i don't know what we get really for, about the resurrection from them um they're, they're, they're mainly helpful through for more the ideas of like i said the messianic expectations uh interpretation of scripture that we actually have 
uh, their uh, kind of commentaries called Pesher. They have commentaries on Habakkuk and uh, other books of the Old Testament. And we see similarities between that and um, uh, the New Testament, the apostles. Uh, just the, the fact that we have those scriptures, the, the Hebrew scriptures, um, the Hebrew manuscripts that date back now to all the way to about 200 and something BC, some of them at the Jordan Museum right there in Amman, Jordan. The five of those Dead Sea Scrolls are housed there. But that that has taken us in reliability of the Old Testament over 1,100 years into the into the past. To uh, just, that just more and more confirms the reliability that that the, the scriptures were transcribed and copied and copied and copied correctly. And so, for example, we have the entire Scroll of Isaiah, and um, and 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 it and it dates to about 150 BC and the earliest one we had before that was around uh, 980. So we're talking about going back in time, almost 1100 years. And we can see that the, the Jewish scribes copied and copied and copied the, the scroll of Isaiah for 1100 years without internet, without computers, without you know anything else. They did it almost with exact precision. I mean, we're talking just small variants of spelling er, spelling changes and different things like that grammatical differences so so there's so many things that the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls give us but on the resurrection uh, I don't know exactly what I would what I would point to for uh, what the, except the fact that you know they, they they fall in my examples of movements that just disappeared <laughs> I think the Essenes were of men they they did not continue they were not they were not a god movement <laughs> So uh, another question that came up, uh, based on what you shared about people rejecting elements of Christianity based on their circumstances or moral choices, do you believe this COVID-19 crisis will help draw people closer to God and push them toward belief in God? Or will the opposite happen and people will wonder why a God would allow a pandemic like this to occur? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I mean, probably both will happen, but, but I hope more of the former because you know i think it's times like this like even like after 9 11 you know y'all remember you know after 9 11 the churches were were packed in fact bring up tim keller again that that's what made tim keller a mega church pastor you know it was his church was was just hundreds of people before 9 11 but then it became thousands in new york after that and so you know events like that will shake the idols in people's lives and uh, let them see what's really important. And people are really seeing it now because people, you know, in their daily lives have been, are chasing all kinds of different idols if they're not following Christ and being stuck at home. <laughs> most likely your idols, you can't chase as well right now. And so, so I think, I, I think our prayer should be in our, all, all that we can online and any way we can with our neighbors is to point them to uh, the image, the true image of God, the true, true person to follow point them to christ another another question is was there uh i don't know i i guess you could say you know the the icing on the cake is there one particular thing that you uh, that you identified as man this is this is the tipping point for me personally on the resurrection there's something that you've read or something that you studied uh, intellectually that said, yep, uh, this one put me over the edge uh, in the resurrection. I, I don't think it happened that way for me. I, I would say it, it was really the more cumulative case that I kept engaging in, whether it was from C.S. Lewis or from when, when, I, when, I came to Christ, when, I, when I became a Christian in college. One of the earliest books I read was by C.S. Lewis, of course, uh, Mere Christianity and, and Miracles, but also uh, Lee Strobel's Case for Christ and uh, other books like um, I eventually got into William Lane Craig's books and, and N.T. Wright and others. But I would say now, looking at thinking about it over you know about 20 years now, I would say the thing that is most most compelling to me of, of, of it all, it's all compelling, but to me, the thing that is everything is that I know, we know, he hung on that cross and died. And then we know that movement exploded. That, that like I said, I like the image of it, like a singularity. We know that singularity 
exploded. That big bang happened in Jerusalem. So what is it between there that caused that? To me, that that just there's no other explanation. To me, to me, it's a it's more of a miracle. It's more of a miracle that all this happened in our world from the Christian movement if Jesus stayed dead. To me, that's more of a miracle. Cool. Okay, I, that's, uh, you know, I've got uh, one other question. What's your story? And I think you've covered a little bit of that. Uh, as far as your story, you said you came to Christ in uh, college. Uh, what brought that about? And then I guess we'll open it up for some other questions. Yeah, I'll just say briefly, I, I've shared this a few times there. Um, my, my story is, I grew up in a, in a, in a Christian home and, and, uh, uh, but like I said, it was very, very, very watered down. The church was watered down that I went to and it was more just God is awesome and things. I never really learned anything about apologetics or evangelism. We really didn't study the Bible really, really either. And uh, so I, I would just say growing up, I was, I would have called myself a Christian, but I like to, I, I call, I refer to myself as, as a pain burner. I was just somebody who, who was seeking to make money pleasure uh, didn't care really about anything religious and when I was in college I went to Southern Methodist University SMU and uh, my wife she was my girlfriend at the time uh, we were basically the same mindset uh, together pagan parties and coincidentally Halloween night 2001 we were waiting in line for a uh, sorority fraternity type party where we were going to go and, you know, get drunk, do, do the normal thing, pagan partiers do. And I was dressed up like Satan and she was dressed up like a devil girl. And we were waiting in line and a guy was sharing Christ with the girl in front of us. He never talked to us at all. But, but I, as I, I wouldn't have said this the, the, the day after, but, but hindsight's 2020. As I look back on this moment, I don't even really know. He was challenging her about Jesus. And he come up to the line. He was there in deep. It was in deep Elm. He was there in deep Elm specifically to do evangelism, which I had never seen before. I'd never seen someone be challenged to come to know Jesus. And and God used his challenge to her to say, "Follow me." To me, that was like my regenerative regenerative moment. I think that God really opened my eyes, um, and I saw really what was going on in the matrix. I realized where I was, and I need to be fighting. I need to be fighting for Zion. But, um, but, but so soon after that, I changed everything. I was getting, I got a business degree, but, but I had planned to go to law school, but everything changed. I ended up going to, to Dallas Seminary and, uh, and, and went straight through with the master's and PhD and on and on. So, but that was the, defin that was the defining moment. But, but it was soon after that, that I read the Bible for the very first time. And I started reading immediately apologetic books because I was, I was evangelizing myself with people <laughs> very quickly. And so I was quickly wanting to engage them with the arguments the resurrection so there you go uh dr halen you looked like you were wanting to ask a question hello dr halen miss you brother dr halen you have to unmute yeah. there you go i hit it twice yeah <laughs> in fact i came from greek in order to <laughs> come here um yeah i'm replying to President Smith's comment there. Uh, um, what what um, secular sources from the early centuries of the Christian era uh, help us to kind of see that ha the validity of the gospel stories are, you know, things that people are saying who aren't necessarily believers. But they're noting and they're 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 thinking there 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 might be something to this. Do you, do you have any sources that you've come across? Yeah, my my favorite uh, would be the, the earliest ones that kind of you know put the meter on this. Like I said, the if you think of the the, the Big Bang analogy, you know the, the it going out and the first time that we have people outside of the the, the followers of Jesus speak. We have Josephus, the Jewish historian. He's already telling us that James, the brother of Jesus, has died, clearly for his faith in his brother. <laughs> uh, he's died as a blasphemer. 
probably proclaiming Jesus as, as, as God, as the Son of God, and uh, he died right there in Jerusalem. And he also tells us that Jesus was called the Christ and that he was crucified. And, and, and sadly, we have some, in, some doctoring of that text by some of the scribes who, who transmitted that. But, but most scholars agree Josephus said something probably to the effect of uh, this claim of his resurrection. And we also have Tacitus, a Roman historian, who, who does say not only that Jesus was crucified and this movement, you know, has, has originated in Jerusalem and it's now come to Rome and he, he hates it. You know, he's, he's uh, speaking of it, but he calls it superstitious. He calls it based on the superstition. And it's this key word that's even used in the book of Acts for the claim of the resurrection. So he's probably referring to this early claim that they, that the Christians were making that Jesus had risen from the dead. And then also you have Pliny the Younger who's writing to uh, Emperor Trajan right at the turn of the second century. And, and he's asking basically what to do with these two who they call themselves deaconesses, who he's tortured, and they won't sacrifice to the gods of Rome. And they won't deny Christ. They won't deny this Christ that they worship that as God, he says. And, and it's an incredible just statement that, you know, here you have these two women, these unnamed, unsung heroes that were being tortured and would not deny their faith. An, an incredible thing right there at the turn of the second century. So those are our three, I think, earliest. You, you would know as well. But, um, but th those, are, those are pretty compelling to show that this movement has, has already spreading throughout the Roman Empire, that, that they're making the same claims the New Testament tells us, and that even Jesus' brother is being killed for these things. Yeah, and I would, I would say that it's also interesting to think in terms of the rep the noticed radical change in people's lives, people don't go against their cultural, you know, paradigms uh, if it so if it works against their self-interest. And yet, hundreds yeah. and thousands of people were just changing everything uh, for for some odd reason. Uh, That's right. It's it's inexplicable. It's inexplicable without something happening. Well, speaking of that, uh, uh, Rob down in uh, Guatemala asked the question. He's saying so. Uh, using the criteria, I, I agree, Doctor Halen. You were breaking out a little bit, so I couldn't hear, but I think I got the gist of, of what you were saying. But yeah, the transformed lives is such a powerful thing. It's still all over the world, but I think for those first. 300 years before Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. That's where it's so powerful because these people, you know, they, they looked around and they were just a small segment of the Roman Empire and they're being mocked and persecuted. And I mean, what is their reason for following this crucified man? I mean, it had to have been, it was beyond just stated evidence. It had to have been power. There had to have been just power of the Holy Spirit that just transformed their lives. Uh, Justin, in that regard, uh, Rob from Guatemala says, or ask, uh, so using the criteria for of man and, or of God, how do you explain the growth of Islam compared to Christianity? Only one preacher's resurrection, uh, but both are growing belief systems. I didn't get all that, but I, but I think I know the, I, I think I heard basically what the chat, comparing Islam and Christianity, the, the, right? The growth. Yes. So, so I talk about this in the book, and, and this, this is one that, like, if you talk about the fourth fact, the bedrock fact that I, that I bring up, the advancement of, of Christianity, the triumph of Christianity, people will say, well, what about Islam? Look, Islam also has done that, and that's true, but the key thing is, is to look at the, compare, compare the origins, and really compare the first few hundred years of, the move, of each movement, and that, that's, again, where I think we, we have something absolutely unique in Christianity and, and, and beyond that, that it's the only true world religion. But compare the origins. When Muhammad died, he had already conquered multiple nations. He already had tens of thousands of followers. So their movement, the Muslim movement, went on and continued to conquer by the sword after that. And, and that to me and to any historian is not miraculous at all. I mean, you would expect that. I mean, Genghis Khan, when Genghis Khan died, his son took over and they kept conquering. That, that, that's an expectation of history of a movement that is conquering nations. So now compare the Jesus movement. 
when Jesus died, how many nations had he conquered? How many followers did Jesus have? <laughs> Passionate, ready to, to go and conquer the world followers when Jesus died. He had some women weeping at the cross. <laughs> they, were the, they were the boldest of them all. The men were cowering in fear, and Peter was weeping. They were convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah. And then beyond that, the Christian movement, when it did start, they didn't kill anybody. They didn't conquer any nation for the first almost 300 years. And so I think that those differences really, really are. are. So, so with, with Islam, you just have, you just, you just have one person who, who makes a miraculous uh, claim, and that's Muhammad. So you're basically putting all your trust on this claim of Muhammad. And his movement acted like a, an army. It was an army. And so you, you can explain very quick, easily through history why it would conquer and why it would continue. But with the, the Jesus movement, you have multiple witnesses who make this claim that Jesus appeared to them. Multiple individuals, multiple groups, believers, unbelievers, like I said, and the inexplicable advancement throughout the Roman Empire, like we were saying before, and eventually conquering the Roman Empire. Uh, I think that, that, that is, is something that, that needs to be focused on. When you look at the origins, I think that's when you really see the contrast. Well, guys, I don't know if any of you, any more of you have questions, but it's a little after 12. So uh, uh, you are welcome to uh, interact with Justin. Uh, he is here in Dallas, so you could probably uh, contact him. Justin, your email address is justinbass at... Uh, justinwbass at yahoo.com. Yeah. So you can follow, follow up with questions. We are recording this session. And so if you, uh, if you would like, you uh, can get on our, our website a little bit later. We'll have a link for you. I think we'll see, even send you an email with the link so you'll have more information. Justin, can't thank you enough for sharing with us, especially on your birthday. Happy 39th birthday. Yes, thank you. You got to say it to me in Arabic. Come on. Uh, can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few more trips and you, you'll have it down. There you go. It was a great trip uh, to visit with you guys and share uh, the message. We loved having y'all. That was a true highlight of our three years there for sure. Yeah. Well, okay, guys. Uh, thank very you. Again. To be here. Very honored to do this. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Yeah. Thank you all for attending and uh, um, uh, watch for future you, events. Crystal. We'll let you know. All right. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. He is risen. He is risen. risen indeed. Happy <laughs> Resurrection Sunday. There you go. Very great. Even better.